Welcome to the Lock Sportscast, your weekly source for Lock Sport news. This is episode 118, recorded September 11th, 2022. I'm your host, Charles Grant. And in today's episode, Vault Breaks on Election Day, Vampire Bondage, Flipper Zero has PayPal problems, Are Plug Followers Illegal, Lockpick Gin, Meetups, Criminals, Sales, Giveaways, and more. You can subscribe to the audio version of this show on most podcast apps and at thelocksportscast.com. You can subscribe to the video version on YouTube, Odyssey, or Apple Podcasts. Links to stories discussed will be in the show notes. Some apps limit the length of show notes and the ability to post links, but you can find full show notes with all the links at thelocksportscast.com. So first up, we have an interesting story out of Barnstable, Massachusetts. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. It appears that they had a problem with a large vault they used to store ballots on Election Day morning. The story says that uh, Election Day had to start later than normal on Tuesday after the town clerk was unable to open the vault where the ballots were stored. The clerk had to notify the Secretary of State Elections Division that they were unable to access the ballots in order to send them to the polling places. Polls were supposed to open at 7 a.m., but weren't able to open until after 11 after the clerk printed out some emergency ballots. And the Massachusetts Security of State, William Galvin, had to obtain an order from the court requiring the polls to stay open until midnight to make up for that lost time in the morning. The article says that around 4 a.m. on Tuesdays, officials went down to the town hall basement to open the vault and get the ballots out. The vault has an old steel door with a combination lock, but The registrar couldn't get the vault open, knew the code, but that wasn't the problem. They're not exactly sure what happened, but sometime between Saturday, the last time the door was open, and Tuesday morning, the door broke. Evidently, the handle sheared off when they attempted to open it. According to the locksmith, when the handle was sheared off, the long core that went two to three inches into the door was pulled out. And they said in some situations, they could attack a new handle onto the end, but since it broke off inside, that was not going to be the case. The locksmith tried several different approaches, each taking a lot of time and work. In the end, he ended up using a drill, scope, and sledgehammer, and uh, a lot of work to get in. The solution to the problem, evidently, was drilling all the way through the door to access an interior handle that allows somebody who's stuck inside to get out. Had to drill through the door a couple of times to slowly work that handle open far enough to get the vault door to open, and was finally able to get in, but at which time it was too late for those specific ballots to be put into service to get them out to the polling stations. So employees were going to have to hand count all the ballots because the emergency ballots they printed up were not going to be able to be read by computer. The locksmith told the news that he did not think the vault had been tampered with, that this was an issue of overuse over the last 60 years or so, and possibly an overzealous tug on the handle in the morning. And this story is a good reminder that if you have a safe or vault that you rely on, probably be a good idea to call in a safe and vault tech every so often to just go through it and make sure everything is in good shape and you're not going to end up getting yourself locked out anytime soon. Next up, we had an interesting story sent in by a bunch of people. Uh, The remains of a, quote, female vampire with a sickle on the neck and a padlock on the toe were excavated in Poland. Researchers uncovered the remains of an alleged female vampire in Poland with a sickle across her neck and a padlock on her toe to prevent the woman from rising from the dead. The skeleton, which was found wearing a silk cap, had a protruding front tooth, which may have led to her being labeled a vampire, they say. The sickle that she was found with was not laid flat, but placed on the neck in such a way that if she were to rise from the dead and try to get up, most likely the head would have been cut off or severely injured. According to Smithsonian Magazine, in the 11th century, citizens of Europe reported fears of vampires and began treating their dead with anti-vampire rituals. 
believing that some people who died would claw their way out of the grave as blood-sucking monsters that terrorized the living. And by the 17th century, such burial practices became common across Poland in response to reported outbreak of vampires. Other ways used to protect against the dead rising from the grave included cutting off the head, legs, or placing the deceased face down to bite into the ground, burning them, smashing them with a stone, or hammering a metal rod through the skeleton. The padlock on the toe appears to be more symbolic than anything. I'll have a couple different uh, stories on this linked in the show notes in case you want to learn any more. Unfortunately, they don't show the padlock on the toe anywhere. So we don't know what the padlock that was used way back then actually looked like. That was something that I was kind of hoping to find. Next up in the news, I don't have any specific details, but I am told that lockpicking patrolmen and SE Lock and Key are reporting that Schlage has recently told locksmiths they are discontinuing their Connect and Sense smart locks in favor of the Encode line. I'm not particularly familiar with any of those models. I'm not a big aficionado of smart locks, so doesn't mean much to me, but if you are, or you are a locksmith, that might mean something to you. And over on Twitter, Flipper Zero put out a thread of tweets about problems they have run into with PayPal. They say PayPal has blocked our business account and is holding 1.3 million US dollars for more than two months without explaining what exactly they're not happy with. Even PayPal support doesn't know what's going on. This endangers the production of Flipper Zero in general. On June 7th, we launched sales on our shop.flipper0.one store. Customers had two payment options, directly via card or through PayPal. More than half of customers chose PayPal. After a few days of sales, PayPal initiated the compliance process. They asked for some documents and we immediately provided them. Then there were a few more requests, which we also submitted. And after, we got this, quote, your account is permanently blocked. And they say, we've talked with at Ask PayPal, but they can't say what exactly compliance team want from us. Right now, we need to pay for new production batches, and this money is critical to our business. If there is anyone from our community who has direct contacts of PayPal internal team and somehow can influence the situation, we kindly ask for help. And there was a, a reply linked to here from Lockpicking Lawyer who said, I feel for you. This happened to at Covert Instruments when we got started. PayPal sees a brand new business growing too fast and gets nervous because PayPal is on the hook if it turns out to be fraudulent. It was at least six months before they stopped delaying payouts. But what's interesting about this is a couple of the, the screenshots that Flipper Zero sh shared said flat out that they will no longer be getting service from PayPal and that they'll have to wait 180 days for the payment of their balance. Which just seems absolutely ridiculous. After seeing this, and hearing what Lockpicking Lawyer said there, I'm starting to think that if I were to ever come up with a product that I wanted to sell that had anything to do with InfoSec, or security, lock sport, anything like that, there is, I don't think I would be doing PayPal. I would find some other service because because I wouldn't doubt that the type of product being sold by both Covert Instruments and Flipper Zero might be part of PayPal's hang-up there. It could be the quick large amount. It could also be, as one commenter said, that there are concerns that some of the money could be going into Russia. But it's hard to say, since they won't answer questions. They don't have any good customer service. They have $1.3 million of this company's money and won't even give them any customer service, won't explain anything. Nobody seems to know anything. To me, that's just like highway robbery. We're going to hold your money. We're going to collect interest on it while it's in our account. And too bad for you. And moving on to videos, several people sent this in also. A uh, stupid law makes this illegal in Alberta, a lawyer explains. This is a video by Runkle of the Bailey, and in this video he explains why an Alberta, Canada law makes self-repinning kits and probably other items sold at Home Depot possibly illegal, and well, probably illegal by the definitions they have in the law. 
I'll leave it to you to go over and watch his video to find out exactly why, but this would obviously cause problems for anybody in the lock sport community, anybody owning anything to do with lock picks or lock disassembly tools could be in trouble if you live in the Alberta area. And next up is another video by uh, Donut Media. I covered them, I believe it was the last episode. This one, they're testing car break-in products, as they say. We tested car break-in products. And in the video, they try their hands at various tools, including leashy picks, uh, air wedge, and slim jims. Many of them obtained through covert instruments. I skipped through it. They do show basically how to use the different uh, products and the, how difficult some of them can be, like the Slim Jim, and how easy some of the others can be. So might be worth checking out. Moving on to the products front, this one is a little different. So if you like gin or you just want a novelty product to add to your Locksport collection, check out the Safe House Distilling Company. This is an article that was posted called ABQ Distillery Brings Home Four American Craft Spirit Awards. At the American Craft Spirit Awards, Safe House Distilling Company brought home several medals, including silver for its barrel-aged lockpick gin and bronze for its regular lockpick gin. And it's pretty cool. Comes in a bottle. It's got a padlock on the label. Lockpick gin. Might be interesting for those of you who are into gin or, like I said, if you just want something different to put with your lock collection. And I've mentioned this before, but it was brought up again on Twitter this week. There is a book that is due out uh, next year called Locksport, A Hacker's Guide to Lockpicking, Impressioning, and Safe Cracking. It is by Joss Weirs, Matt Burrow, Walter Belgers, Beanie A to Z, and Nigel Tully. Uh, it's available for pre-order at Barnes & Noble and No Starch Press. There was a coupon code... or. There was a discount available if you pre-ordered through Barnes & Noble up until like a day ago as my, I'm recording this, so unfortunately that's passed, but there is also a 30% pre-order discount if you order directly from No Starch Press on the book's page, which will be in the link below. And according to Barnes & Noble, the release date is July 25th, 2023. Moving on to events and meetups. We had a couple of new ones shared, and I'm going to list them in the order they appear in. So the first new one comes first, and actually the second new one that I'm listing is actually listed last, because it is the last one on the timeline. Anyway, listed on meetup.com, Canberra Locksport meets every second Sunday of the month in on Baconsfield Street, Fishwick in Australia. And they say the Canberra Locksport Group is for anyone interested in lockpicking, physical security, the inner mechanics of locks, etc. All skill levels welcome. And the link to their meetup site will be in the show notes. And then we have Hack for Kids taking place in Chicago on September 17th. ISSA's LA Summit, the 12th Annual Information Security Summit will be taking place September 20th through the 22nd. They have a physical security keynote by Deviant Olaf. Besides Charlotte, taking place in Charlotte, North Carolina on September 24th and 25th. Besides Augusta in Georgia, taking place on October 1st. Yankee Security Convention, taking place October 19th through the 23rd. Besides Triad, taking place in Greensboro, North Carolina, on October 22nd. St. Con 2022, October 25th through the 28th, in Provo, Utah. Keynotes by Deviant Olaf, Stephanie Snow Carruthers, and Jason E. Street. Besides Charleston, taking place in Charleston, South Carolina, November 19th. And this last one is a new one, the Pacific Hackers Conference 2022, November 18th and 19th at the Hacker Dojo in Mountain View, California. I don't have any new Lockpickers United belts to announce this week. I didn't see any, and nobody sent any in, so we're just going to move on. Over at speedlocks.org, Panda Frog has put up a post about some new updates here. We have new attempts on the Lock a Quarter contest for the Mako 425 and 427. 
He said uh, Speednut 1 took the lead with a new record time of 7.234 seconds. And shortly after, Picksmith tried his best but failed with a time of 7.474. Out of the blue came Prince and took the lead with a time of 6.033 seconds. So some good competition going on over there. And then we have some new records set. So the Multi-Lock Classic with serrated pins by MC in 40.6 seconds. Packlock 100G by Matt Coda in 5.633 seconds. And the Mako 427 by Prince in 6.033 for the Lock of Quarter was also a record time. So way to go, Prince, on that one. And then he also posted some new first records, which are basically records or times on locks that don't have any record established yet. And they got the Zeiss Icon SK6 Sperville Extra Code. I don't know how that's pronounced. Anyway, by 206 in three minutes, 1.833 seconds. The Medico Bioxo 5 plus pins by Alpama in 37.4 seconds. Degard HQ lock by HV Logic in 3 minutes 22.1 seconds. The Brickard block out by HV Logic in 5 minutes 40.334. And the Cobra Micro by HV Logic in 1 minute 26.733 seconds. So, congratulations on all of those records. Thanks for the update on that, Panda Frog. Now it's time to take a quick break. Say thank you to the people that made this episode possible. I'll start with the Patreon subscribers. We have Jimmy Longs, Medler, Panda Frog, Michael Gilchrist, Starlock, Williams Brain, Dave to be deciphered, Lee Bond's Locksport Journey, Pat from Uncensored Tactical, Three Raccoons and a Coach Terrell, aka Anthony, Dr. Hogmaster, Clayton Howard, aka Coltone, Mog, John Lock, Rat Yoke, Mr. Picker, Cranky Lock Picker, JHP Picking, Bare Bones Lock Picking, Deadbolt Cafe, NWA Lock Picker, and Snake. Chief content producer for this episode is, again, Cherell, a.k.a. Anthony. Other content producers, Barebones Lockpicking, Brandon Ashurst, Cranky Lockpicker, Da Thirteenth Monkey, Even Fleur, Holly, Ifisk, James Randolph, Joshua Gonzalez, Keyless Entry, Knox Locks, Lockpicking Dev, Pandfrog, The Lockpicker 1969, and Tony Varelli. Thank you to all of you for your support. And remember that this podcast is only possible because of that support. If you enjoy the podcast, if you think it's worth having out there, please help keep it going by sending in news, links, events, giveaway information, anything you come across, anything you know about that is Locksport related that you think the community should or would like to know about. You can send all that to either podcast at locksportscast.com or any of the other methods listed in the show notes. Don't forget to share the show with your lockpicking friends. You can always leave a review, comment, thumbs up, whatever your platform of choice allows. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you want, you can support via PayPal or Patreon. If you support the show with a donation or information I use on the show, I will give you credit in the show and in the show notes. If you have any interesting stories about things that happened to you in Locksport or because of Locksport, you feel free to send those in for me to share on the show. If you'd like to send feedback that can either be confidential or public, you can do that. Go to uh, thelocksportscast.com slash contact or email me the uh, email address podcast at thelocksportscast.com. We have one lockpicking criminal story this week. This one was entitled Already Convicted of 20 Crimes and Facing Charges on 18 More, Whatcom Man Arrested Again. And it says that this Whatcom County man who already has 20 convictions and is awaiting trial on another 18 charges is suspected of stealing memorabilia from a storage unit and later attempting to elude sheriff's deputies. According to Whatcom County Superior Court documents, deputies saw a vehicle parked on the wrong side of the road. They checked the vehicle's license plate and found it was registered to the suspect in a recent burglary. Deputies say that they spoke with the suspect and asked him to step out of the vehicle, and then he drove away at a high rate of speed, running a stop sign in the process. Deputies followed, attempting to get him to stop, but he refused to pull over. Deputies then lost sight of his vehicle, but eventually found it unoccupied. After using a canine, the suspect was located reportedly hiding under a deck. The suspect later allowed deputies to search his car, and documents state that they located a lockpick set in the vehicle. 
The sheriff's office booked him on suspicion of attempting to elude police vehicles, second degree burglary, possession of burglary tools, obstructing a police officer and resisting arrest, and jail records show that he is being held on $125,000 bail. So let's see, 20 convictions and 18 charges pending and decided to run up some more. Some people just don't learn. Moving on to sales. We have one here. Peterson's announced a Labor Day sale, but it is actually good through the 14th, according to this. It's 40% off of two select pick sets, no limits or minimums. And it's the Wombat and the Dark Web sets, which are on sale at 40% off. The code is, the code will be in the show notes if you want it. It's another one of those random letters and numbers that I don't really want to read out here on the, the podcast. Southord's sale items page is still up, so you can check that out if you need anything from southord.com. Looks like the link for the 10% off discount code through Review Guru on Twitter is still good. I will link to the Twitter post where he shared that. I don't know if the summer discount code for Lalock Tools is still good, but that was summer 25 for 25% off. Worth trying if you are happen to be shopping over there. Barebones lock picking, you can get 10% off store wide except Law Lock Tools products with the code PRINCE10. 3DLockSport.com, you can save 10% with the code LSCAST10 when you check out. MakeoLocks.com, save 15% with the code BYMAKO. And UKLockPickers.co.uk, 10% off with the code GIFT. Moving on to giveaways, nothing new this week, same ones as last week. We have Lockpicking Dev doing a uh, giveaway for having 200 videos up and 500 subscribers. And the winners will be announced in video 200, which will be his next video. So if you haven't yet, get your entries in for that giveaway. And the Lockpicker 1969 is running a series of giveaways, one every week. Be sure to check out his channel. Link will be in the show notes. Noxlock is doing bi-weekly giveaways, so be sure to check out his channel. Again, link in the show notes. CLK Supplies does weekly giveaways as well, so uh, link to their giveaway page in the show notes. Thank you to everyone who keeps listening. Nothing really new to report on a personal level this week. Just dealing with a couple of issues with our dog's health, but everything is going good, so nothing to worry about there. Anyway... Really appreciate everybody sending in all the news this week. We had really good participation. Please don't take that in as, as you don't need to help next week. I, I can always use all the help I can get. So thank you. And remember to keep it legal. Legal.